going to be talking about a quote, the worst president. Donald Trump is the worst president for the environment in U.S. history. The actual quote, the direct quote is, Donald Trump is the worst president for the environment in our history, and he is working every day to double down on that fact. That's a quote from Adam Bateman, Sierra Club National Press Secretary. Now, during his term, President Trump has successfully gutted or reduce an estimated 125 environmental regulations. Everything ranging from vehicle emissions to mercury levels to drilling on federal land and water. The administrator of the Environmental Protection Agency, a former coal lobbyist, bragged in an op-ed in Newsweek that his agency had created, quote, five cost-saving deregulatory actions, meaning anti-environment, for every one regulation implemented. And keep in mind, implemented regulations means that uh, these are regulations that cleaned up America's water, air, and land for the last 50 years, many of them. Now, on Wednesday, regardless of who wins the presidency, the United States is formally out of the Paris Climate Agreement, an agreement set up to reduce greenhouse gases that are raising the global temperature. Keep in mind that if we go past 2 degrees centigrade, According to 2,600 scientists, 2,600 scientists in the United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, when we hit two degrees, we may reach a point where we reach and uh, you can't go back. Basically, it'll be uh, something that will be catastrophic for all living things on the planet, and obviously including humans. Uh, so on October 28th, Donald Trump permitted trees to be chopped down on 9.3 million acres out of 16.7 million acres of the Tongass National Forest in, Flor in Alaska. The Tongass removes more global warming carbon out of the atmosphere than any other forest in America. Now, earlier this fall, Trump appointed a climate change denier, David Legates, L-E-G-A-T-E-S, to Deputy Assistant Secretary of the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, NOAA. The NOAA measures the warming of the Earth, tracks hurricanes, of which we've had, I'm sure you know many, many this year, and uh, fossil fuel emissions. The Gates has argued that the NOAA data indicating global warming is faulty. Now keep in mind, nobody else is saying that Climate change is not real. No major country, no major political leader, only Donald Trump has called it a hoax. Now, in doing all this, and I'm going to now go to some of the videos, see if we have anybody who wants to uh, chat, just in case someone wants to New chat. York homeowners, if you have a power meter like this inside oh. of your house, you can... I'm just now going to make sure to see if anybody. Uh... Wants to chat so. Now, in talking about this, a lot of people have talked about all the different environmental regulations and that uh, Donald Trump's administration and from the EPA to the Department of Interior to the Bureau of uh, the Parks Department, National Forest, all those things, every chance he gets to drill. It's all pro-business. But there's one thing I want to talk about in particular here, and that's something called the EAB, the Environmental Appeals Board. Now, Trump's anti-environment strategy goes further, according to a former high-level official of the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency. The former official believes that the Trump administration took away a key tool for poor communities, especially communities of color, to fight pollution that afflicts them. The former official told TYT, uh, TYT investigates, that the EPA is, quote, I'm quoting now, curtailing the ability of environmental justice communities, the communities who are disproportionately impacted, to be able to meaningfully participate in the EPA's permitting decisions. That is when the EPA gives permits for uh, companies to do things. And many of which we've seen in the past have, you know, pollute the environment 
And that's what the EPA's job is set up to stop that. But now we have an administrator for the EPA appointed by Donald Trump, who is a former coal lobbyist, whose whole career was spent on attacking the EPA and stopping regulations. Now, the former official specifically pointed to a fundamental altering of the Environmental Appeals Board, the EAB. Now, the EAB is part of the EPA. The Environmental Appeals Board is actually part of the Environmental Protection Agency. Now, before the Trump administration, three independent judges of the EAB would review projects approved by the Environmental Protection Agency. And sometimes they would rule against their own agency, even though they're part of the EPA. The courts often sided with the EAB rulings the majority of the time because the EAB was three independent judges. And so the courts acknowledged that these judges were very good, they were independent, and they oftentimes would back the EAB uh, decisions. So that's why the EPA actually was very powerful. The EAB was basically an appeals board for the poor communities, especially for poor communities of color. They were disproportionately impacted by pollution in this country. And the reason for this was that when you petitioned the EAB, the Environmental Patrol, Environmental Appeals Board of the EPA, you only had that you were dealing with three judges. And you would only need one lawyer or two. You did not need an entire team of lawyers or lobbyists, which were, who would be very, very expensive, but the corporations can all afford. But poor communities, and especially communities of color, could not afford. So this was a key that communities of color would be able to petition to stop some company from polluting their environment. But under the present Trump appointed EPA administrator, the EBA rules, EAB rules, the appeal board rules have been altered, making it harder for poor communities to use it. Now, because people like Andrew Wheeler were technocrats, coal lobbyists who spent many, many years trying to defeat the EPA, he knew all the ins and outs. He knew what rules were good for the environment, were good for poor communities to be able to fight against big companies. And he eviscerated them, basically, according to some of the people that I've talked to, former officials of the EPA. One example recently made a very simple rule change that said you had to speed up the review process that the EAB, these three judges, had to speed up their process. And in order to do that, to speed it up, the, uh, you had to hire basically more lawyers to be able to make it very simple and present everything clearly. And you had to present it now in a shorter amount of time. Now, shorter time means you have to hire more people to do this project for you. So these poor, this very simple rule, speed up the review process, meant that, um, hi, uh, we, YouTube uh, cut my signal or my uh, Wi-Fi stopped for a second. To, again, T.Y. Chang from T.Y. to Investigates. Hopefully it's going to go back on here. And um, so uh, let me continue. About so Andrew Wheeler, the administrator of the EPA, a former coal lobbyist, had worked many years against the EPA. So he knew what rules made it difficult for him representing the coal industry to be able to pollute, basically. And what happened now is that as the administrator, you put the fox in the hen house, the administrator of the EPA, he changed some of the rules for this one little part of the EPA, the EAB, the Environmental Appeals Board. And by making the review process shorter, it meant that you had to speed up, you had less time to present your case. So in order to do that, you have to hire more lawyers and that's more expensive. And that's exactly what poor communities, especially communities of color cannot afford. Let me give you one example. On September the 30th, the EAB judges under these new rules turned down a request from the Navajo Nation and environmentalists to stop a utility company, the Arizona Public Service, from discharging wastewater from a steam power plant into a lake on Navajo land. Now, the permit to do this was revoked by the Obama administration, but now has been upheld under the Trump administration. So that's one key area, not talked a lot about, you won't see this in anywhere else. I mean, 
not the Washington Post, not the New York Times. They make a brief mention out of 100 things. But according to a former high-level EPA official, this was one of the critical things, especially for poor communities of color, to be able to challenge permits that were given to industry that the communities felt were polluting them, polluting their environment, polluting their water, their land, their air. And this now has been weakened by a few simple things, like you've got to review it faster and these type of things, and now it's made it more difficult. In fact, the former high-level official felt that it's easier for corporations now to use this appeal board than it is for poor communities. That's one thing. Here's the second thing that's also uh, critically important uh, in terms of uh, how the Trump administration weakened or gutted environmental laws. This former EPA official cited Trump's weakening of what some call the Magna Carta of environmental laws, the National Environmental Policy Act, NEPA. Now, since 1970, NEPA has required all projects with federal funding to conduct an environmental impact study, EIS. Now, you've probably heard about this. You know, when you have a project, interstate highway, for example, there had to be conducted an environmental impact study. These were very thorough, and they discovered things that a lot of the um, businesses did not want discovered. But it's very difficult to do that. You have to have real experts get in there and check the air, the water, check for, you know, different species that, uh, you know, are impacted by whatever's being done. For example, a highway. Now, you've probably heard about this a lot because it's been here since 1970, signed by Richard Nixon, a Republican. Oh, God. This. I'm going to try something else here. No, 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 no. Let's see. Okay, are we on again? Yes, we're back on. Uh, I tried a different, uh, instead of my Wi-Fi, I'm trying to use the Verizon mobile. So, okay, so let me finish this up because apparently the gods are working against me <laughs> on this YouTube live thing. So, and, um, so the NEPA required an environmental impact study for any project they would have federal funds in it, like an interstate highway. Now, the rule changes, again, one of the big ones, the EPA, Andrew Wheeler, the administrator there, has now put into process, uh, put into effect, is that you now have to speed up the process. Now, they're limiting the environmental impact study to 150 pages. That sounds like a lot but actually isn't a lot because when you do an environmental impact study to make it thorough, it really takes a lot of effort and a lot of work to be able to catch things that a lot of the businesses want to hide. Now, how do the environmentalists react to this? Because we know how the Sierra Club reacts to Donald Trump. They called him the worst president for the environment in our history. And he's doubling down, that Trump is doubling down every day on this according to the Sierra Club. Now, according to Defend Our Future, it's a project that the Activist Environmental Defense Fund, one of the largest environmental activist groups in the United States, Environmental Defense Fund mobilizes young people for climate action. It responded to our request, TYT's request, for a comment on the NEPA rollback. Quote, time and time again, and during a global pandemic, no less, the administration has placed the interests of corporate polluters before the health and safety of the Americans while seeding climate leadership on the world stage. That's from Jonathan Suhu, manager of Defend Our Future. Now, if, still a big if, Joe Biden wins the presidency, he's stated that if he's elected president, he will restore the NEPA rules and rejoin the Paris Accord. But just as leaving the Paris Accord took nearly four years, that process took four years to leave the accord, it will be a lengthy pro process to re-enter it take years, could take years. And this same scenario is expected for other environmental regulations. Some estimate it could take years to restore the environmental protections established in the 46 years before Donald Trump became president. That is, if President Biden chooses to do so, because he may choose to do so, it will be despite possible pressure from some business interests who enjoy 
the more polluting, relaxed environmental regulations that the Trump administration has come up with. Keep in mind, this was all about supporting big business. This is not about supporting small business. And to be fair, Donald Trump did try to improve some cleanups of Superfund sites. Those are where you have so much, uh, a company has dumped so much toxic chemicals, it's declared a Superfund site. It's so, so bad. Donald Trump did try to clean up some of those Superfund sites that were not, some of which were not cleaned up by the Obama administration. But <clears throat> overall, it's pretty clear that Donald Trump is anti-environment, a climate change denier, and he has done, reversed more environmental regulations than probably all the previous presidents since 1970. No doubt about it that he's done, re, uh, reversed more environmental regulations than all the presidents since 1970. And remember, in 1970, keep in mind, when you talk about make America great again, he wants to go back to the 50s and 60s. <clears throat> in 1970, the, all the major cities in America were so smog-filled you could not see. It was before catalytic converters cleaned up you know, the exhaust from cars. And the toxic pollution was so bad. For example, the Cuyahoga River in Ohio, hello, Ohio people, was on fire in 1970. And that's why in 1970, Earth Day, April 1970, one out of every 20 Americans marched for environmental protections. And those environmental protections that are supported by nearly 90% of Americans, and that includes 67% of Republicans want something done about climate change, and 90% of Americans, uh, of Democrats want something done about climate change, and more than 80-something percent of Americans overall want something done about climate change, and Donald Trump has done the opposite of fighting climate change. He's actually hurt it. And the argument is by the Democrats that four more years of Biden, I mean, four more years of Trump will be disastrous, not only for America, but for the whole world in terms of the environment. So uh, looks like we're able, to, uh, we're able to keep talking about that. And I am going to now try and talk to some of the... Um, okay, we've got a bunch of people who are <laughs> now talking about not the climate, not the environment, but Ronnie Van Q. You have to wonder if that's a QAnon type of person. Uh, he says that, um, what about Hunter Biden? That laptop, Hunter Biden, according to 50 former American intelligence high-ranking officials, was most probably a Russian plant. And it's a dirty trick. So that's why Twitter would not, you know, let the New York Post put that out and, and have it retweeted because, in fact, it was probably a plant to try and affect our elections. So uh, let's talk about some of the climate things. Charlie Hunt says, Donald, DJT, Donald J. Trump, the worst... POTUS, President of the United States for the Environment, you don't say. I guess it's obvious to him. Reverend Christian Bastard, Bastard Trump, available soon for children's parties and Halloween events year-round. Okay, we're now we're, we're all being mean, and let's talk about... Um, Lady Cece Duchess, Trump's not only the worst president in history... I assume for, she's talking about the environment. She's, let me just quote her directly. Trump's not only the worst president in history, he's terrible. Double exclamation point. And uh, yeah, we're not, um, Robert G. says, yeah, maybe we should talk about Ivanka, Don Jr., Eric, Jared Kushner, and the rest of them, too. Yes, John T., it is T.Y. Chang, but let me reiterate, let me talk about, I'm going to talk about this again. I'm going to recap everything. 
Uh, I'm giving you a quote now from the Sierra Club. Quote, Donald Trump is the worst president for the environment in our history, and he is working every day to double down on that fact. That's from Adam Bateman, Sierra Club National Press Secretary. And what I was basically talking about is during his term, President Trump has successfully gutted or reduced an estimated 125 regulations, ranging from vehicle emissions to mercury levels to drilling on federal land and water. The administrator of the Environmental Protection Agency, the EPA, who was a former coal lobbyist, bragged in an op-ed in Newsweek that his agency had created, quote, five cost-saving deregulatory actions for every one regulation implemented. He was bragging about that. He was proud that he was actually getting rid of environmental regulations that have helped clean up our air, land, and water in the last 50 years. And I just pointed out a couple of things that had just happened recently. You know, on November 4th, regardless of who wins the presidency, the U.S. will be formally out of the Paris Climate Agreement to reduce greenhouse gases. On October 28th, Trump permitted trees to be chopped down on 9.3 million acres of the Tongass National Forest in Alaska. And that's out of 17 million acres. Now, Tongass National Forest in Alaska removes more global warming carbon out of the atmosphere than any other forest in America. Think about that. These trees are hundreds of years old. They're huge. And this is a pristine, vast forest on the southeastern section of Alaska. You can look it up on Google Maps. And he wants to, he's now given permission to, to chop trees down there from a forest that takes out the most carbon of any forest in America. Now, earlier this fall, Trump appointed a climate change denier, Donald Legates, or David Legates, to Deputy Assistant Secretary of the National Oceanic or Atmosphere Administration, NOAA. Now, the reason why he made a Deputy Assistant Secretary that doesn't have to be cleared by Congress, you know, the, the, so that you can just appoint the person and, by executive action. Now, the NOAA measures the warming of the Earth, tracks hurricanes and fossil fuel emissions. And this new Deputy Assistant Secretary has argued that the NOAA data indicating global warming is faulty. He doesn't believe it. He doesn't believe in global warming. He's a climate change denier. But I wanted to emphasize, um, again, to talk about something in the EPA called the EAB, Environmental Appeals Board. According to a former high-ranking official of the EPA, when it was actually an EPA, this former official said that this was the main way that community, poor communities, especially poor communities of color, could actually challenge a polluter because you didn't need a whole team of lawyers, you didn't need lobbyists, it was just three independent judges. But these judges were so respected that a lot of the courts then would follow whatever decision they made. And what Andrew Wheeler, the new administrator for the EPA, did was he basically changed some simple rules. Like you have to review pro faster. You have to, the review process has to be quicker. But by doing that, to make it quicker, you have to hire more lawyers. That costs more money, exactly what the poor communities can afford. And a recent example of this decision, on September 30th, these EAB judges, the new judges under these new rules, turned down a request from the Navajo Nation and environmentalists, including the Sierra Club, to stop the utility company, a utility company, Arizona Public Service, from discharging wastewater from a steam power plant into a lake on Navajo land. Now, that permit was revoked during the Obama administration, but now has been upheld under the Trump administration. So let's go to some more. Uh, Joyce Wildcat says, Trump is destroying our environment and he doesn't believe in science. Well, you have, to, you have to at least suspect that there's a lot of truth to that or at least consider it, regardless of your political power, uh, party. If you consider that Donald Trump has not listened to the science and deals with the, term, the dealing with the pandemic. And there's some talk now that he's talking about firing Dr. Anthony Fauci, if he gets real, if Trump gets reelected, there's some there's some hints now that he may fire Fauci, and this is a guy who's been protecting us, you know, for decades and dealt with HIV, the AIDS crisis, dealt with SARS, so many different things, the Ebola crisis, and he's been probably the top guy most trusted in America to deal with this coronavirus, 
in this COVID-19 uh, pandemic. And then now he's talking about getting rid of him. Why? Maybe because he's more popular than Donald Trump is, uh, which is just crazy that you even think like that. X, Jax X says, that makes me sick, so sick that they could cry. Nikki Dearest Gogo says, he's allowing, uh, he's talking about, she's talking about Donald Trump, he's allowing logging companies to cut down old growth trees in a large American forest, 300 to 1,000 years old. Now, I don't know if it's 1,000 years old. I will take Nikki Dearest Gogo's word for it, but certainly this Tongass National Forest in Alaska, 17 million acres. Donald Trump has said, okay, let's let us cut down trees and 9.3 million acres of it. So more than half. This is a pristine, vast forest that removes more carbon from the atmosphere than any other forest in America, and Donald Trump now wants to destroy it. Just as the Amazon is being destroyed there for loggers, uh, yeah, you have to wonder, and I guess I should be checking to see uh, how many logging companies, how many timber companies have donated to the Trump campaign so that he could do this. I mean, he just did this last week, so I didn't have time to check that. So, again, you know, what I'm talking about is that Donald Trump has been the worst president for the environment in our history, according to the Sierra Club. And I suspect a lot of other environmental organizations would agree with that, that this is, uh, if you've, you know, either gutted or weakened 125 environmental regulations. That's according to the Washington Post. Now, the New York Times quoting the Harvard uh, Law uh, Environment uh, Law Center, uh, they, they came up with 100, including uh, 40 that are pending. So he's still doing it, even in the last seconds, that even if Donald Trump is defeated tomorrow, and I hope all of you go vote, regardless of your party and your affiliation. It is critically important. It's our responsibility. So vote, vote, vote. Uh, I know how I'm, I already voted. I voted last Wednesday because I wanted, and I did it in person because I wanted to make sure that my vote would count. Let's go to some of the people. Jody Atkinson, remember Trump tried to sell off Bear Claw Park public lands to old companies, to oil companies. Aha, uh -huh. yes, that is I think that's true. I, I can't confirm that, but we can certainly look that up. Uh, Jody Atkinson says, remember, Trump tried to sell off Bear Claw Park to public lands to oil companies. And John T. says, we've been selling billions in paper waste to China that we could be recycling ourselves with proper investment. Well, that's important. Paper recycling is one of the most profitable. In fact, I think it is the most profitable recycling we have. Keep in mind that for many years, China bought our garbage, number one, and then bought our recycling. And part of the reason why now, and if you look at, at the plastic recycling, you look, there's that little, the only thing that gets recycled now is number one and two. It goes up to five and six or more. The majority of our plastic now, the overwhelming majority, practically all of it now is not recycled. That is a phony uh, campaign funded by plastic companies and petroleum companies and oil companies, fossil fuel companies, to convince us that it's okay to use plastic because after all it's being recycled. The fact is it is not being recycled. After China stopped buying it because they have so much plastic of their own, they stopped buying, uh, taking American garbage, they stopped taking, China stopped taking American waste plastic. Uh, the, after that, we are now stuck with it because it's our garbage, it's our plastic, and we need to find a way to recycle or stop using it. We use, on the average, I've read that there's some people saying that every person uses about 5,000, roughly 5,000 pieces of plastic. Go right now into your, into your own home, in my home. I mean, you look at, you know, what do you wash your hands with? It's a plastic container for soap. Uh, what are you cleaning with? Your cleaning solution comes in plastic containers. What are you washing your clothes with? Probably the container is in a plastic container and little pl plastic wraps around even the, 
the individual uh, the detergents. So we have so in plastic water bottles, which is ridiculous to me. I mean, everybody can get a water bottle and fill it up with clean water. Well, should be able to fill it up with clean water. Although with Donald Trump continuing, who knows what will happen to our water. And uh, John T. In Germany, recycling is mandated and carries a fine if not done properly. Styrofoam goes with plastic. That's something that, um, you know, Michael Moore in his movie, Planet of the Humans, now, he made a lot of mistakes. He's wrong about wind and solar. Wind and solar is sustainable, and the technology has improved dramatically since, uh, I guess, he did his research. But Michael Moore, I believe, is correct about one thing. We need to rethink the way we live our lives. We cannot keep living our lives and just waste energy and waste and use up plastic and, you know, buy, buy, buy. My teenage son says that he and his friends all frequent thrift stores. Why? Because he found out that buying a new pair of jeans takes 500 gallons of water. So he goes to thrift stores now to buy used jeans that would just get thrown away in the garbage and clean them up and use them again. It's become now the, for this generation, I guess they call them Generation Z, for these teenagers now, who are going to have to deal with climate change and the climate crisis. You know, if we don't start changing, you know, we reach the point of no return in 2050 or sooner. It's actually, scientists are saying we are actually going to the point of no return faster than what even they thought. But the limit now, the, the cutoff point now, if we don't change our, the, our, our, our carbon exhaust into the atmosphere uh, by 2050, that it's the point of no return. So the, our my teenage kids are going to have to live that. I don't know if I'll be there, but they definitely will be there, you know, and they're going to, and so these kids are now a lot more aware and hopefully all those 18 year olds are all voting to, you know, uh, early or voting tomorrow for sure. So, uh, Lori, uh, ostrich dump Trump. Our planet is dying. This is not an exaggeration that our planet is dying. I'll give you another example. Uh, the extinction of species. In 2019, 500 species became extinct. 500, according to the scientists. In 2020, the first half of 2020, it's already 500. So now as we are now, species are becoming extinct at double the number that they were in 2019, which was even more than the year before. So every year, because we keep cutting back the natural uh, habitats, we keep reducing it, more and more species are becoming extinct. And by the way, this also has something to do with the pandemic. As we reduce the amount of wildlife living space, you know, wild areas, wild animals are forced to interact more and more with each other and pass on more diseases that then get passed on to humans, including the coronavirus. So, there is a, Christ is God wrote that the heavens and the earth will pass away. The word of the Lord will remain forever. I believe you can be a Christian and still believe that, you know, we need to change climate change. I don't think God wants us to poison ourselves. I don't think God wants us to be. Uh, I, I would hope that a a loving Jesus Christ, in any case, would certainly want us to clean up our environment for our children and not have them, you know, start breathing dirty air, drinking dirty water, and going back to the way it used to be in 1970, when the good old days, when the environment was disgusting and much, much dirtier and unhealthier. John T. says we're already in a paradoxical situation where our pollution, both causes the global catastrophe, but the immediate removal of it would also accelerate the process. To involve for 200 characters. That may be true, but here's an example of something that has happened. In uh, 2019, for the first time ever, more electricity in the United States was generated by renewable energy sources, hydropower, wind, and solar, than coal. Keep in mind, 12 years ago, coal provided 50% of the, 
of the electricity in the United States. And now it provides only 17.1%. And in 2019, renewable energy provided 17.5% of America's energy. So it is not impossible to change things. It's already happening because even the oil companies are all talking about how they need to transition to renewable energy sources. Even the oil companies realize this is the end, that the world is waking up and realizing that, you know, with the wildfires in California, the, the hurricanes, one after the other, double hurricanes even, uh, hitting the south, and then the flooding that hit the Midwest before, and now that half the country is in a drought, the, if you don't think we're in a climate crisis, then you haven't, you know, really, your head is in the sand, <laughs> and it, that sand is getting a lot hotter. So, um, uh, J.R. Hernandez says we should re replicate what France is doing with their water system. Now, I don't know exactly what France is doing with the water system, but I will look it up. Uh, but getting back to the thing about Germany, Germany and Japan, I do know, have a far more stringent recycling system than we do. I know in Japan, it, the last time I read it, they have 10 different categories for recycling. That is for, for metal, for glass, for particular types of plastic, for paper, uh, for organics. And in Germany, I know they have separate containers for organics uh, if you, so that the food is not just thrown away and put into land, landfills. It's actually, you know, stuff is done with, uh, you know, where, where it's composted and used again so that we don't have to keep using chemical fertilizer. So Germany and Japan, they, they are doing these things. And I remember that in Michigan in the 1980s, when I was a reporter there, the people talked about, oh, nobody will recycle. People just won't do it. The politicians said that. Even the scientists said that at the time. But the people themselves, regardless of their political affiliation, everybody, the overwhelming majority, started recycling on their own. And, and the, the political leaders and the politicians and the, political, the officials were like, oh, surprise, people are willing to recycle. I think people recognize that when something works, and make sense that they will follow it. Uh, when we started saying there should be a deposit on, on bottles, people said, oh no, that won't work. But then when it did work, now it's become part of the landscape. Everybody does it. Catalytic converters, if, you know, vehicles, all vehicles in the United States are required to have a catalytic converter, which basically takes the exhaust and removes 90% of the emissions, the toxic emissions but it also takes away 10% of the power. When that first came out, the catalytic, catalytic converters in the early 1970s, the, uh, a lot of people were saying, this is un-American. You're taking away my freedom. You're taking away my right. But what happened over the years when it became the law and requirement, all of a sudden the air cleaned up in a lot of cities. Denver, for example, where the smog was so bad that you couldn't see the mountains. Los Angeles where you never could see the mountains. Although now with the wildfires, you can't again. But for a while, you could see the mountains. You know, it, things were clearer. And all of a sudden, nobody complained about the catalytic converters anymore because it worked. When you come up with things that work, people are not stupid. People understand common sense. Okay, some people are stupid. For example, if you're not wearing a mask during this pandemic, to me, because for whatever reasons, if you refuse, either you don't care about people or you're stupid, you don't realize this saves lives. I'm sorry. Wear a mask. It's not that big a deal. You can wear three masks and still breathe. Just take a deeper breath. Uh, I know it's not, you know, comfortable, but if it saves lives, why not do it? If it stops the pandemic, why not do it? Even the president of the United States, Donald Trump, when he didn't wear a mask, got COVID-19. Now, because he's the president of the United States, he's rich. He got you know, an experimental treatment. He got a dozen doctors. He got an entire ward of the hospital devoted to him. The same day that he got it, I read that two African-American women who didn't have his kind of money caught it. They were younger than him, and they died. So keep that in mind. So base things on science, and I think eventually people will come around. Just like the catalytic converter, nobody talk, complains about it anymore. Nobody says, oh, I don't want my air to be clean, but I want to be able to go, you know, 
three miles an hour faster on the interstate and get a speeding ticket. Okay, uh, let's go read some more stuff. Uh, John T. says, as long as it isn't on an Impala, which is an old Chevrolet, great car, by the way, catalytic converters work. Uh, the Impala would last for 200, 300,000 miles, but if it didn't have it a catalytic converter, it was polluting our environment, it's got to go. You know, uh, much as I, I love the Impala and uh, I love the Chevy Nova, if they don't have a catalytic converter, they've got to go. Although, you know, the, the old, really old cars uh, are grandfathered. You don't have to put a catalytic converter, probably, uh, but you probably should. Jane B says, our forest will be destroyed forever. Is he planting new trees in California burned areas? You know, remember when Donald Trump went to California and he said, oh, don't worry, it's going to cool down. Ah, uh, science doesn't know everything. That's what he said to somebody. He said, Mr. President. And he said, oh, the reason why there are wildfires is you're not managing your forest properly. And then someone pointed out to him that 90% or very high percentage of the forests in California are federally run. And who's the head of the federal government? You know, buck stops there. No, it's never his fault. But anyway, um, William J. McCartan says, when will the oceans pass a tipping point in regards to their warming? Is there such a thing? Well, we know that for the coral reefs already, that the huge portions of the coral reef, the Great Barrier Reef in Australia, have died. They go from the bright colors and they turn white, pale, and they're, they're dead. So the warming has already started to affect huge portions. And in fact, I read something last week that said even at the lowest depths of the ocean, they've been able to measure warming. That's how far it reaches. I don't know what the tipping point is. That's a good thing to look up. I will look it up. John T. says everything, quote, he says, that isn't monstrous is false. Okay. But again, uh, let's talk about the environment. Uh, I'm the climate change investigative reporter for TYT Investigates, part of the Young Turks. And this is something that in the eight months or so that I've been the climate change reporter now, has it been eight months? Not even eight months. It's just approaching eight. It's, it's really more seven plus. Uh, the more I read about the climate change, the scarier it becomes. It's, to me, it's not really climate change, it's climate crisis, soon to be climate catastrophe. And the problem is that it's something that, you know, it's not that easy to see that quickly. It's something, but when you measure it, you see that those tiny increases, I mean, really think about it, two degrees centigrade seems like such a small amount, but two degrees centigrade warming up the earth will put us to a point of no return where you think the wildfires are bad now. I mean, the, the whole world's going to be on fire. The hurricanes will be reaching. There was, in fact, a typhoon in the Philippines. The, 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 um, the wind speeds were 235 miles an hour. Now, that's due to climate change, according to the scientists. And if we start seeing those, I mean, look at the damage from 150, 150 miles per hour. 235 miles per hour is like tornado speeds. That's going to wipe out you know, we're talking about wiping out whole sections of cities and sections of, of the suburbia. That's what's going to happen if we don't stop that change. Something I read about recently is very interesting. When you release carbon into the atmosphere, it doesn't disappear. It doesn't die. It doesn't fade away. It stays. So the carbon we have in our atmosphere now is from 150 years of the Industrial Revolution. And I read this in a, um, written by a British author who pointed out that although right now China produces more pollute carbon into the, puts more carbon into the atmosphere than the United Kingdom does. Because the United Kingdom has been using those coal burning plants, you know, for literally a hundred something years, the amount of carbon the United Kingdom put in is number one in terms of the amount of carbon put into the atmosphere that's still there, not going anywhere, the United Kingdom is number one because of all the years they use those coal-burning plants. And China is down at number five or six. Now, could they overtake it? Probably not, because China now is at least trying to convert to more solar energy. And as President Xi Jinping is committed to carbon neutral by 2050. We've not done that. 
President Obama did, President Trump has not. President Trump has in fact reversed it. It's a funny thing that I talk about. I talk about <clears throat> like this is zero, you're doing nothing. And the Green New Deal with Bernie Sanders would cost 16 trillion. And then Joe Biden's green uh, program would cost two trillion. To me, Donald Trump's program is negative 16 trillion. Now that's not an exact figure, probably exaggerating, but not by much. Because if Donald Trump gets reelected, you can look at a negative 16 trillion amount of damage to the environment, the environment for the whole world. And right now, you have to wonder, a lot of the world doesn't trust the United States anymore. So John T. at X, Jack X says, that's why GMOs are not allowing science deniers to control the narrative around GMOs is so important. We can carefully modify our environment to adapt faster than evolution would permit. If we allow, if, for example, Joe Biden wins and he keeps his word and... I think he would actually, but if he's allowed to, if business doesn't somehow get in there and, you know, put pressure on him and Congress not to do this, if they're able to start building for wind and solar and create millions of jobs. Now, keep in mind, <clears throat> Donald Trump promised to save the coal industry. He tried. He completely failed because that's a dying industry. Rather than trying to save a dying industry, Joe Biden's talking about um, taking the coal industry workers and oil industry workers and training them to build wind and solar. It's a lot easier. It makes a lot more sense to train construction workers from oil, gas, and coal to be able to deal with construction of wind and solar. There are, in fact, right now, sorry, I just hit a wire. There are, in fact, now more <coughs> jobs in the wind and solar and renewable energy than there are in oil and gas and coal. And that's something we already have reached that point. We should be doing more for that point. Uh, Riddick Bo says, my prediction is there, there will be a series of solar flares and electromagnetic pulses. Okay, well, you know, Riddick, I don't know what you're basing that on. And uh, I don't know that anybody, even the solar scientists have not been able to predict when that's going to happen. So, um, okay, you know what? I think I'm going to end this, uh, uh, this discombobulated uh, YouTube video cast. Uh, I apologize that it broke up, but at least we were able to finish. If I don't see some more new uh, chats there, I'm going to break this up. I am going to start returning <clears throat> on Wednesdays, and I will return this Wednesday, and at 11.30 a.m. Eastern Time, I will start having a live broadcast again uh, to come back to being in touch with people. And, and I would ask you, before I go, this is the article that I just published this morning. You can find it on Twitter, at T-I-H-U-A-C-H-A-N-G. That's my Twitter account. Or you can go to T-Y-T... Dot com. That's the Young Turks. Just Google the Young Turks and go to TYT Investigates. TYT Investigates is the news unit for original reporting of the Young Turks. And this article just came out today. I would ask you to go there and, and please, you know, read it, share it, retweet it, put it on LinkedIn, put it on Instagram, put it on Facebook, put it out there on social media. This is critically important you know, that uh, we understand exactly what Donald Trump has done to the environmental regulations. He's really done more damage uh, than any president in modern history. I, I think that's fair to say. He would say he's done more to help business and environmentalists would say he's done more to screw business, uh, screw the environment than any other modern president. Okay, I'm T.Y. Ch <laughs> Chang. As you can tell, I haven't done this for a while. I'm T.Y. Chang for T.Y.T. Investigates. Again, please go to tyt.com, check out this article. And thank you for your time. Thank you for following this. And thank you for caring about our children and grandchildren's future. Be safe and be well.